is about you. The infinite you. The part of you that can't be seen, can't be smelled, touched, or tasted. But you know you feel it. Who you really are. In a world lost to confusion, a universe that's partly illusion, when we look for meaning, we often simply find more delusion. Ground your consciousness in the sounds of the universe, a podcast about your true omnipotence. There's a universe inside each of us, but our beliefs keep us constrained to the edges of what we can imagine. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garden and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all. Our lives. What's up? Welcome to the one within all. Thanks for tuning your digital device to the Innerverse. Whether you're joining us for the first time or the 50 millionth, it is a miraculous marvel that our minds can meld through the magic of the modern technological age. And we can have this type of talk about the one within all, which is what I like to say in my most frequently used opening statement. I choose to say that particular phrase quite intentionally because one of the biggest messages I like to promote is the subtle and powerful truth of that all-powerful feeling of I-ness or isness that I perceive, and it's the exact same feeling of isness or I-ness that you perceive if you're to use psychedelics or spiritual techniques to temporarily strip away all facets of the personality, your history, your external reality, what would be left? Even without language, the feeling that I am is the common spark that fuels all life, the entire universe, and everything. It's the tangible connection to the otherwise unspeakable, undefinable mystery that is infinity itself. In science, the I am is actually called the hard problem of consciousness because there's that pesky little fact that no matter what mechanisms are modeled, It is impossible to create a scenario of consciousness emerging from unconsciousness. So it must have always existed. Aficionados of quantum physics will be familiar with the primary role that conscious awareness plays in manifesting phenomenon from potentiality. And we can never really ponder this fact enough because it's part of a constellation of information that basically proves that consciousness or spirit is the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, never born and yet never dying, and it's therefore eternal. It means that creativity and imagination are not the results of mechanical thoughts reacting to stimulus, but that thought itself is a facet of the imagination. And the imagination is the foundation of everything. And beliefs are the boundaries and limits of what we, as infinite consciousness, are able to experience. Here to break down the components of consciousness and help us integrate a more complete awareness of our universal situation is today's guest, Paul Linda. Paul is the founder and director of SHIFT, and he acts as a guide to conscious evolution through writing, speaking, personal coaching, and utilizing a lifelong and extensive background in eclectic spiritual practices, all to shine light on the wider horizon of our infinite reality. Paul is the author of an excellent book called 
the creation of a consciousness shift. And he is here today to talk about some of the very simple concepts and practices we can fold into our perspectives in order to bring more love, growth, and freedom into our lives. It all starts with perspective, as I often say, and the realization of the essential oneness of all things is probably the strongest foundational awareness we can focus on. I'm sure Paul will have plenty to say about the nature of the true higher self and how to filter out the noise of the ego and material reality to illuminate and elevate ourselves from identifying with the less virtuous aspects of our personalities. Find Paul Linda online at shift.is. That's shift, period, I-S, where you will discover a plethora of articles and resources from both the scientific and spiritual dimensions. And get in touch with this kind soul on his website if you are interested in some sage guidance or you want to rekindle your own inner fire and joy for life, or you just want to talk. You can find links to Paul's website, his book, and YouTube channel in the show notes for this episode, along with the link you'll need to sign up for Interverse Plus, where you can gain access to the extended version of this episode, two hours long instead of one, and a huge archive of double-length episodes for that. Low, low price of $5 a month. And big news, everyone. If there's ever an episode you want to hear the extension for, but you don't want to sign up for a monthly recurring donation subscription, I don't know why you wouldn't want to do that. But if you don't, you can now get individual episodes of Interverse Plus on my website for $2 a pop. I just want to give you guys the option. Probably should have done this a long time ago. But hey, we live, we learn. Thanks again for coming along on this ride where we will be taking a scenic view through the science of spirituality. And please join me in projecting a massive psychic love bomb of welcoming energy to shower our most majestic friend, Paul Linda, on his first trip to the Interverse. Thanks for coming on, Paul. How's it going? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me on here. Absolutely. I've seen you online for a while through various alternative social media outlets that we're both on. I think definitely on minds.com and now this new one I've been checking out called MeWe. And it's cool to see that there is a way to actually connect with each other online despite the harshness of censorship of certain types of information on the mainstream platforms, or at the very least, the drowning out of that stuff through all the noise that comes through with, you know, all the divisive political you know that that all exists on the alternative social media as well. But I thought a good way to kick off our conversation today would be to ask you to define the term spirituality in terms of how you use it in your work and your authorship. Well, spirituality is very simple at its core. I think it's often overcomplicated, but I like to just frame it as love in action. So you embodying love and expressing love is the the core of spirituality. And with that, the, the love stems from this underlying understanding or understanding of the interconnected wholeness and oneness of everyone and everything, of all consciousness. And so if everyone and everything is connected, then everyone and everything affects everyone and everything else. So you want to love, you want to be compassionate, you want others to feel good. And so at that core, you see this in every major belief system since the dawn of time. That's the golden rule. Treat others as you want to be treated. Why? Because we're all connected and we're all affecting each other for positive or not. I think that's a really good answer. Spirituality is often linked with things that can be materially seen or perceived, but what you're talking about, this interconnectivity, is just that very thing. Although I think on different level of awareness, we are able to see and perceive that. And in the book, uh, you hinted at some of your own personal revelations about the nature of self and cosmos when you were younger. And so can you tell us about your background and what some of those original revelations were or how they came about? Sure. So my my awakening, as it's called, was a gradual awareness to seeing the greater whole 
as it truly is instead of all the layers that have been superimposed on it by society, by conditioning. And I had to first strip away all of it because I had a lot of programming from the, uh, the culture, from religion, from school. And so at some point during adolescence, or at the beginning of adolescence, when my brain started able to think for itself and question things, I was seeing like, these things don't make sense. Like there's a lot of things <laughs> in reality uh, on this planet that don't make sense. So I looked into, you know, if I can find alternative perspective and boy, did I find alternative perspectives. So from, from 14 or so onwards, first looking into the paranormal ghosts and UFOs, uh, strange mystery plus spots like the Bermuda Triangle. That got me into later on learning about creating some energy balls. So unlocking psychic abilities, creating psi balls. And those, those are my first real world experiences with the intangible, unseen aspects of reality in science and class. They wouldn't talk about that you can create energy balls in your hands, but yet I, I did and I can feel the streaming energy through my, my palms. So that one thing led to another and I started learning more about consciousness itself, which is a fascinating topic because it's a topic that science cannot explain uh, in a coherent manner. And it wasn't until I discovered Dr. Fred Allen Wolf, who is a really fascinating explorer of consciousness in the scientific realm. And he was really able to articulate using quantum physics and his own personal experiences with consciousness studies that there is something that's larger than us. Consciousness does not come from the brain. The brain is more like a receiver, like a TV of a signal, and it transmits consciousness from elsewhere. So then that gets into higher dimensions and then I explored that and I first, in my experience, I was like, I see all these people taking psychedelics and they have all these experiences of these higher dimensions and these beings and whatnot. But I felt if I just took psychedelics and I then would always kind of question myself, was that just the creation of my mind? Or was that actually a true um, connection to an, another part of reality? So I decided to do techniques that involve just my personal mind power. So I learned about meditation and how to take the inner paths to outer space, including astral travel and out-of-body remote viewing and those kinds of things. And my experiences showed me that, wow, there is more to reality than what I can touch and what I can, can see uh, with these eyes. So I learned about the pineal glands, how that's an atrophied third eye, and learned how to squeegee that one and being able to see more clearly and go farther, connect with my higher self. And then later on, I found the diviner sage, which is a beautiful thing. I was like 18 at the time, I believe. And so before that, I only did personal modalities like the ones that I explained. But then I found the sage and that hyperspace is something that I never experienced prior to that with those other techniques. And yet it felt so real and so much more real than this reality. And I, I saw that a lot of people have really difficult experiences with that space, but I found that it was a very welcoming space and I even felt in a couple of the realities that I actually was there before in some previous incarnation of my consciousness. So that all was very interesting going into learning about multiple timelines simultaneously, bifurcations of timelines and so many fascinating things. So I, I continued exploring in that way with other entheogenic tools, but I like to focus on what I can do within myself because I think that's the most important thing to really feel 
empowered that you are the infinite explorer and you can steer this ship and you don't need to be taken all along for the ride in a way that you can't consciously control it entirely. And there's, there's a lot that you can do. So you just need to believe and just practice at it. (laughs) It's interesting that you bring up this researcher named Wolf. What was his full name? Fred Allen Wolf. I believe he was in What the Bleep Do We Know? And he also then had a another like cartoon kind of show that he did to explain quantum physics and consciousness. That's cool because right now it's January 20th and today slash tomorrow is a full moon. The full moon in January is the wolf moon, but it's also a blood moon and a super moon at the same time because there's an eclipse. So very powerful, I guess, wolf energy right now because you bring up a guy named wolf and to me what i understand about that particular animal spirit as a teacher is that it represents sort of that dichotomy between the one and the many because there's both there's two archetypes at play with the wolf there's the lone wolf that is a solitary hunter and able to be completely self-reliant but then there's the wolf of the pack that those are both metaphors that we think about and how the, the pack kind of works and acts as one and the teamwork involved in that and the amazing bond that must exist between that type of a close knit. And you see that in animals all the time, like birds will move in exact unison with each other. They have a definite link in their consciousness. It's quite obvious. Fish is another example. So I think it's cool that you bring up this researcher and I'll have to look into him because it sounds like he was heavily inspirational. And I'm amazed that you went so far so fast while so young because a lot of us are too busy (laughs) with whatever it is that we choose to bog ourselves down with, especially in the teenage years, the programming is hard to shake off for some. And the the deprogramming doesn't even start until the 20s for some people. And anyway, I think that I had a similar experience to you starting out with meditation practices, but maybe not as many fringe type practices. I wasn't really going out of the body and then explored psychedelics to see what that world was like, but didn't want to get stuck in a dependent relationship in what, like you said, not having full control. Not that that's too scary to handle, but that you could have one psychedelic experience that could take you five years to fully integrate. They're just so it's, you're tapping into the infinite. So no need to go crazy with that stuff because it can make your regular life get messy. (laughs) A lot of the bleeding effect of imagine wild and unconstrained imagination could bleed strange manifestations into your physical reality. I think anyone that has has considered themselves a psychonaut will probably attest to that. And so I like what you're saying that you can do all this with the power of just your own mind. And I guess it'd be interesting since we are talking about this researcher, what can you tell us about the science of interconnectivity of consciousness from uh, your own exploration? Basically everything is made out of fields. There's fields of consciousness that connect. So that's why you see uh, a group of animals. They are all seemingly one mind, but they all have their own minds, but they're, they're kind of like jacked into this greater field that is their localized group consciousness. And so humans as well has a, have a localized group consciousness. And it's just that they are not aware of it as often as they can be. They're not tuned into it, but they can be if they really knew who they are and if they got rid of all the things that cloud their consciousness, you know, through food, through electromagnetic fields, which is the biggest one right now, and just all around uh, ignorance. So the I would say there's something that's, um, there's another really great researcher who's called Dr. Irvin Laszlo. And he's been writing about the science of consciousness for decades. And he's got this great book called um, Science in the Akashic Field, I believe. And he talks about something that's called the Akashic Field or the information field, in-formation, where basically all the information about everything that ever has happened, is happening, or may happen based on what has happened and is happening exists. And you can all, we can all t- tap into it because we're connected to this Akashic field, the source field. And the science of electromagnetic fields, magnetic fields, 
those things are proven because we have scientific instruments to measure them. And I believe that there's also scientific instruments that are able to measure consciousness fields, but they're not readily available to the public. But I think the explorations that you can take through meditation, through remote viewing, uh, astral travel, you can, you can see and you can tap into these grids and these, these grids of, of consciousness are kind of like these cosmic highways, which you can also see in the universe itself. So I like to explain it as the old hermetic axiom as above, so below. So everything that we see in our physical reality, it's very simply reflected in the non-physical reality. And everything that's on the macrocosmic scale is reflected on the microcosmic scale. So you take neurons in your brain, you, you take, you have, we have these imaging techniques now. You can take a picture of neurons in the brain and it looks just like this vast interconnected, like beautiful, um, weaving of ne network connections. And then we have these x-ray telescopes. They can take pictures of the universe and you see the same exact view in the greater universe because you have these things called cosmic filaments that connect these long like neural networks of gases that connect all galaxies together so every, all the galaxies are connected and then you have on a smaller scale you come in in the solar system and the scientists discovered that the sun and the earth have these magnetic portals that connect and then so you bring it down and you find with clairvoyant vision that you see these connections between everyone as well and it's all part of the same field just it just gets smaller and smaller compartments of it so i think the the science of the akashic field is a great book for anyone to dive deeper into what that's all about and i'm sure some people on your show have heard about the akashic records well, that's just people tapping into this vast information field, and they can just pull down information about whatever it exists because it's all it's all there. Just like this uh, zero point energy is all around us, and it's just a matter of tapping into it to be able to utilize it. And that's another thing I would like to see in the future: just having just abundant free energy, so that we don't have to keep destroying this beautiful planet. Ah, so cool. I really like the description of the fields. And I love to remind people that the sun and the moon and the earth and all the planets are connected back to the sun with those magnetic openings or portals that have been discovered. I think that is such an awesome reflection that as above, so below alchemical maxim is one of my favorites as well. And from my own personal experience with clairvoyant vision during a DMT experience I once had. I was not completely alone when I did this, but there were two people nearby in a tent and asleep. And another person was sitting across from me. And I did this, what probably the most potent psychedelic currently known to man, and one that is definitely created endogenously by your own body and by the pineal gland, or at least it has something to do with it. I did this substance and the first thing I saw was were these clouds that were connected by strands that were above all of us. And it was literally like I could see the thoughts of the person in front of me going up to and from this big cloud above us. And the people that were asleep, they were also connected to it. But it was like I was seeing what they were dreaming about up in this cloud. And then the, the weird thing that happened next was I was at a campsite and I was sitting in a chair and I didn't know like the objects around me or whatever. I wasn't in my own home camp. But I had this precognitive experience where the, I picked up a backpack that was under the chair while I was still on this DMT. And I held it out towards this tapestry that was acting as a wall of this camp. And right as I held out this backpack, a person opens up the tapestry and looks in and says, Hey, where's my backpack? I'm looking for it. I didn't even know this person, like some random stranger. And I was already holding it out to give it to him. <laughs> it's just the weirdest thing. I don't know why I felt like sharing that whole anecdote other than that you can definitely perceive 
these fields and this interconnectivity and the intention of the person looking for the backpack bled over into me to give it to him. You know, it's just to me, it's subjective proof of exactly what it is you're talking about. And I'm interested now, I guess, since you did bring this up, you have a course on energy protection from people and from EMF, but particularly EMF is what I'm most curious about. Can you tell us about that course and maybe give us a pointer or two? Sure. That is something that I created because it's so important today more than ever before. If people could see the all the electromagnetic fields that surround them and that they're inside of, they would, would, would feel like this is just LA in the 70s with just all the smog. It's, it's so pervasive. And there's actually there a, a really amazing artist that created these visual depictions of what the, all the Wi-Fi and EMF signals look like. And then you just see the whole cities are blanketed with these signals. And so it seems like, oh, I'm just getting around through my day and uh, I'm not dead. So they're not bad for me. But really, there's more than enough science uh, out there right now that shows not only is it bad for us, but with the rollout of the 5G, it's, it's deadly. And I'll just briefly touch on the 5G in, in the sense that you have like 4G LTE right now. That's like the strongest, highest gigahertz band that we're using for communication. But the 5G goes into the frequencies that previously only the military was using for things like crowd control because it would burn people's skin. And when they started turning on some of these 5G spots in places like Norway, all the birds just just like that just fell out of the sky and died and trees um, dying and people are getting really exposed to this already in certain spots of the world. And they're planning to do more, but there is more and more pushback. And the, the issue with things like that is that it makes it difficult, even the signals we have now all the way down to 2G, 3G, they make it difficult to go out of your body and connect with the source field, connect with things outside of this dense three-dimensional matrix. So is that just a side effect of the technology or is that one of the intentions? I'm not sure, but it definitely is. But you also have the health effects where you're going to be more tense, more anxious, you're going to be stressed out, your, your, your physical body is going to be weaker, your immune system is going to be weaker. And why? one of the reasons, I believe, why there's so much depression and why there's so much autism is because there's more electromagnetic pollution that we're being exposed to. And I think the important thing for people to, to do is research the effects of electromagnetic energy on, on humans and avoid things like having a phone right by your, your head when you're sleeping or, or just even talking on it. Just use, use the speakerphone if you must use a phone. I'm not saying everyone needs to go off into, onto a desert island, but there's, there's things that we can do to limit our exposure and getting wired Ethernet would be nice. But if some people can't do that, just turn off your Wi-Fi at night. There's a lot of, of damage that the EMFs, I believe, are, are causing. And it's really important that we can protect ourselves from it. So I give a lot of these tools as to how to do that. And I lay down the groundwork as to why this is so important. And the the other aspect of, of that course is the energetic protection from other people and things that you can't see because there's there's so much traffic on this planet and you'd you'd be surprised how many external factors are at play in how you feel and there's there's a lot of things that you could call it psychic protection but i just like to say energy protection because it's not important what is actually like bothering you so to speak but it's important that you do something about it so you can have a you can be a clear channel you can be the strongest and most lucid you can be and that you can really like 
upgrade your consciousness and become as aware and as evolved as you can be. Because the whole planet depends on us evolving past the dualistic paradigm, past the all the damaging things that are being done to the planet. And my, my really strong focus is to have people take back their sovereignty. That's at the end of the day, all the problems that exist on this planet, they'll go away once we take back our sovereignty and we start redefining our, our lives as being ours and not someone else's to play with. So, so true, man. I love this. <laughs> yeah. The sovereignty thing is about choosing for yourself. So whenever you even take such a simple action as unplugging the Wi-Fi at night or even go a step further and start getting shielding devices for maybe a room in your home or move somewhere outside of the city, there's a lot of steps you can take. But the key is that you're making the choice. And the choice is what sort of converts the energy in a way. And so whatever is the symbol of your choice to do that is not as relevant all the time. There are spiritual techniques and there are scientific physical techniques. Probably a blend of both is what's going to give you the most confidence that what you're doing is working. And that has a lot to do with whether or not it's working because of what we understand about the quantum nature of reality. The observed outcome is the outcome. (laughs) So if you're observing that you're making the outcome better through taking these steps, you are making it better. And with personal sovereignty, if you aren't choosing for yourself, then something else is choosing for you by default. And that's what it means to be bombarded by all this external stuff is that we aren't choosing for ourselves what we want. We are thinking, the world is going to tell me what my day is like today based on what happens to me. In your book, though, you talk about higher states of consciousness being states like love and joy, and that maintaining these states are the biggest things that transform our reality. I think this ties exactly into what we're saying here, because If you're consciously maintaining those states, that is you're choosing for yourself and not having a state chosen for you. And that's part of what makes you more powerful and that gives you your sovereignty. Can you talk more about maintaining those type of states, maybe some strategies for doing that? Sure. So higher states of consciousness are are states where you feel more energy rather than you being depleted of energy. So... I I think you can start out with just having courage. That's really empowering. And that you can do techniques that focus in on your solar plexus. We have all these uh, energy vortices in our body. And uh, a big one is the solar plexus. That's your power center. And just, just focus in on that. I would say do something called the breath of fire, which is a fast pumping in and out of your belly and breathing through your nose. And you'll feel very charged after that. I would also say meditating and having a mantra that you say mentally, like I am peace or I am love, things like that, that will help. Uh, It's, it's, it's difficult to always be in those states. It's, it's practically impossible given everything that's happening on the planet. But you can quickly shift right back into those states if you just remember that you can be in those states. And I would say there's, there's so much technology in the form of uh, supplements, for instance, that we can take, such, such great tools. So I talk about in the book that there is a serotonin connection to spirituality. And this is key because studies have been found, studies have found that people who are depressed, people who have low amounts of serotonin, they have a harder connection to their spirituality, to the ability to feel love and enjoy. And when they were given serotonin through something like being out in the sun or taking a 5-HTP, which is a precursor to serotonin, or exercising, going, going for a run, all those things, they actually increase the development of serotonin in your body. And they found that they were able to get out of depression more easily. They were able to get in touch with those spiritual states of consciousness. So I would say those are really helpful tools that people can do. And most of those are free. You don't need to 
pay anybody or, or, or buy anything to, to get that increased state of happiness. I love that you brought up 5-HTP because that's something I discovered early in my journey. I haven't been using it lately, but in particular, whenever I experimented with psychedelics, I use 5-HTP because whenever you have a peak experience or a spiritual experience, you actually are using up your reserves of serotonin. And that can even happen spontaneously just from things in life, not necessarily from taking an entheogenic substance. And so 5-HTP, being that it's quite a cheap supplement, is a pretty cool thing to try adding into your mix because it can sort of even that out. You won't be like way up high and then crashing later as, as often, at least in my experience. Also, a disclaimer, don't take it if you're on any kind of, uh, I guess, pharmaceuticals that mess with the serotonin serotonogic pathways or um, with serotonin reuptake that can be messy but if you are someone that is currently interested or using entheogens that's a good thing to use to sort of help help with the edge of that and maybe the dark side of it so i'm glad you brought that up it is a really inexpensive thing to supplement to you normally would get it processed through your food and so i think maybe this is a good segue to ask about the way that the diet both mentally and with what you physically eat impacts your ability to maintain these high energy states. And I will say, I love your definition of higher consciousness, which is having more energy. I've discovered early in my journey that it was gravitating towards things that make me feel more stoked is definitely the key. Things that make you feel more drained, you need to figure out why that is, whether it's a perspective or an idea about that person or situation, or it's actually something toxic that's in your vicinity or you're doing. Yeah, one more thing I want to say previously with the 5-HTP. So you could also take alternatively L-tryptophan, which is an amino acid that also helps in the production of serotonin. And some will even put, some supplements will combine those, right? Right, yeah. I think it's, it's also, as far as amino acids go, it's important to take the essential amino acids, as they're called, in a supplement form because those are there's nine essential amino acids that your body cannot create on its own so there's there's a lot of processes within your body you'll feel way more energized you'll feel you'll feel happier it's just really a good thing to to, to take on a daily basis if you can uh, i'm gonna have to look into that maybe if you link me and more information on it if you have an article or something i'll share that with the show notes because like I wanted to bring up diet because I, I've transitioned to a meatless diet for many reasons, but I'm probably still not taking into account the full spectrum of nutrient ranges that I need to be paying attention to. And that's important regardless of if you're on one type of diet or another. So the amino acid thing, that sounds like a good place to start as far as targeting a, a full, wide, and complete spectrum of the nutrients that your body's looking for. Yeah. Diet is incredibly important. Why? Because the, you've, everyone's heard of it. You are what you eat because you are, uh, wh whatever you put in your body. Uh, let's start with water. It's your three quarters of water basically. So you want to have clean water and the, the easiest way to do that is to get a carbon filter or even like bushcraft one if you, if you need to, but, you can get something that's called the Berkey filter, which is what I have, so a stainless steel tower, and you just pour water from the sink into it, and it has the different filters, uh, and it, it, you just get really clean, pure water. And I would say to go along with that, you can even enhance the water even more by just simply in your mind, just having gratitude for the water, saying thank you. And doing that can actually, and this has been proven by the work of Dr. Masaru Emoto through his water crystal memory work, where if you say a word or you mentally think of a word or a thought form and you direct it towards water, it'll literally change the crystalline composition of the crystals. So if you say benevolent uh, terms like, thank you, I love you, the crystals turn into these beautiful snowflake patterns that, that you see when it snows. But then if you say really negative things, uh, and I won't say them, but they, they turn into these really distorted and ugly. 
things that are very chaotic. And so that discordance then translates into the, the discordance in your body. So it's really important not just to have pure water, but to have the gratitude while drinking the water so you can uh, create as helpful of a water source as possible. And of course, that goes with food as well. With food, you you want to be you want to be supplementing these days in most parts of the world with certain things because the soil has become so depleted that th for the most part they only put in three nutrients: potassium, phosphorus, and nitrogen. But there are so many more uh, nutrients that our bodies need. At least in in permaculture practices, you can get a wider spectrum of nutrients in the soil but usually the the, the produce people get and, and processed foods is just a whole nother uh ball game it, they, they're very de depleted of food uh of nutrients sorry so i would say at, at a minimum uh people should take vitamin d particularly during the winter time when they're not able to get sun because uh studies have found that americans are incredibly vitamin d deficient and vitamin D is also a important component of the creation of serotonin. When you're out in the sun, you're actually creating vitamin D for free. And then you, you get the serotonin as well. So vitamin D is very important. Magnesium is very important. That is, that goes along with the vitamin D. They work synergistically together. So if you take them together and you take the vitamin D in a capsule that has olive oil, they're very helpful. Uh, magnesium is just good for your muscles. Your it, it releases uh, jaw tension, and it's it's really important for your blood circulation. If I ever have a headache, I'll just pop a magnesium, even if I took one already, because it's really helpful. Those those are really two really important ones. I would also take the essential amino acids. Besides that, there's there's Everything else you can you can get in food if you get food in the right place. So for the most part, organic food should have more vitamins than you're you're used to getting through conventional. But that's not necessarily always the case. You're you're gonna want to ideally get like food from a local permaculture farm or just grow grow some of your own food. But it's it's difficult. I I understand that. So it's it's important to just supplement things. Um, on top of our food that we get, I would say there is no one diet because I've just looked into this for so long and being a son of someone who was really obsessed about nutrition and who was into organic food before organic food was called organic food and we were looked at as weird for getting it. It's, it's no diet fits for every person. Everyone is different. They're everything related to your blood type, related to your epigenetic markers based on what your previous generations ate and where you live in the, in the world. There's so many factors at play as to diet. So just to say, oh, you know, raw vegan all the way, like, no, that's not going to work for everybody. Or like you can, you can be, you know, vegan for several months and it'll be great because you're in a tropical place where your body doesn't need these calorie dense foods, but you, you're going to end up having an issue if you're living in Alaska, and you're trying to be a raw vegan. So I think it's very important to get food first and foremost that has the most life force in it. And that's the cleanest food. So food that's the freshest. That's why if you're getting organic bananas from South America, they're not going to be as healthy for you as organic bananas from somewhere local, more local in the States. So you want to you wanna look at that because everything has energy, everything. And if you cut a banana off a tree, it starts depleting from its life force from that moment onwards. And the closer you are to eating it off the tree, the more prana, the more life force you're going to get into your body, and then the more energy you're going to have. So with, with diet, you just talk about it all day. But I think those are the really important components, I would say. Yeah, I think that's a wise, a wise and well-rounded 
approach to diet, specifically the point that we're all different, both in stages of consciousness development and what our physical bodies have evolved to be based on, you know, recent history. That does play a factor. I know the blood type thing, once I looked into that, I found it to be quite helpful, certain foods being to consider that, you know, it's not that necessarily the research that I looked at was 100% right. Like this is good for my blood type. This isn't because some things fit, some things didn't. But it got me thinking about, well, wait, I'm not exactly like everybody else. Maybe there's a reason why I'm kind of averse to eating tomatoes, for no, even though I don't have a particular reason for that. And that actually is a component of the blood type that I am, that tomatoes aren't the easiest or greatest thing to digest. So it's interesting. There's a lot of a lot of exploration and personal knowledge to be gained as soon as you start posing the question to yourself, well, what's good for me? Not just what's what's the one size fits all solution. So thank you for that and not trying to give a blanket one size all fits solution, even though we are all one, there's a reason we're all different. It's so that we can learn what we're particularly here to learn. And <laughs> I couldn't help thinking when we're talking about programming water, does somebody that has a coffee mug that says, I hate Mondays, guarantee themselves to have a really bad time on Monday. <laughs> They're likely to have a bad time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to say that with the, the food, you could also look into Ayurveda. You brought about tomatoes. Well, in Ayurveda, there's different types of body types. And one type can eat tomatoes all day, like I can, but another type eats too many tomatoes and they're going to feel inflammation or some, some other reaction. So I would say at the end of the day, you have to listen to your body because your body is so intelligent. I mean, look at it. It's, it's, it's pumping blood throughout your body without you even doing a thing consciously. You just, you can listen to your body in a way where you're not listening with your tongue, but listening with your gut. And then you'll be able to eat in a way that's optimal for your particular body in the particular situation in the particular time that you're in. So one question I want to ask is, this is sort of a sort of a shift, no pun intended in, in topics, but I'm really interested in just creativity and art at large. And the main if there is one theme of this show is that I'm speaking to unique artists. And I know that you're an author. And in many ways, you're creating a very unique and specific life for yourself. And that itself is a work of art, of course. But I'm curious if you have any other creative outlets and what role you think imagination really plays in our spiritual development as a whole. I believe without imagination, there wouldn't be anything. So being able to tap into your visionary place is incredibly important for not only yourself to feel fulfilled, but also for the entire planet to experience the eternal growth process. Everything that you see around you, that was because someone had a vision. Someone had imagined it to become something before it happened. And creativity is a ex exploration of consciousness, I would say. And when, when I love personally... Uh, I, I don't do it at, at much that much at the moment, but I used to love producing music and creating music. And I, I loved creating these soundscapes that would transport somebody to another world. So I recently created a, a mix called a Pleiadian Vacation. And I was wanting to conjure up the experience of someone taking this cosmic voyage through space and time to this ethereal place and just conjuring up all those feelings so that you can feel like you're, you're there. And I think creating experiences for people is, is some peak experiences is something very worthwhile doing and also for yourself. And I, I dabble in a little bit of artwork, but not that much. I mostly focus on creating music. Uh, I love taking photographs of just beautiful places in nature because this planet is so gorgeous. And you just have to see it and, and appreciate it. And when you appreciate, that elevates your consciousness as well. I see, use, I see all these things as being able to elevate my, my sense of self, my sense of spirituality, and uh, expanding my consciousness. 
I absolutely love visionary artwork. I, it's just, it's so bizarre that you see certain things in the Museum of Modern Art and you're like, how is that up here? But you don't see Alex Gray's uh, paintings up here. So I think it's beautiful. My, uh, my partner is an amazing visionary artist and I get really inspired when I see her paintings and it, 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 it wa- I wish I can do the same, but I think I just don't have the, the patience to be, you know, doing that for so long. But I can see things in my mind's eye that are just these beautiful kaleidoscopic fractal patterns of light. And I just, I love that there's people that can translate that into this physical tapestry. I'm curious if there's anywhere I can see your partner's artwork because I'm always just I'm blown away by the unique expression that someone who would be called a visionary artist can bring about. Each and every person who is doing visionary art of any type is creating something so unique and beautiful. And I appreciate all of it. I personally have gained a lot from the process too of, of just plugging away at something and keeping your intention and energy working on it. Even if I, even if you don't have quote unquote, the skills to make something that's photorealistic or that looks the way someone else looks. If you just put the time and energy into it, something will emerge that's unique and different. And the the energy itself will make the creation bigger and faster than what you even possibly could have imagined it to be if you're, especially if you're early in the process. For me, it's kind of like channeling even. I don't particularly visualize a thing so much as I just flow with whatever ideas come out right then in the moment. And that's another great thing about art. You can use it as your imagination is kind of like a very multifaceted tool. You can use it to shine a light inside and look at stuff and see, see images, or you can use it to almost like a third ear and automatic writing is a thing that I found to be quite useful for even, even automatic speaking in a sense, like without being in a full trance state, you can just, ask yourself a question. And the first thing that comes out of your mouth, listen to that. (laughs) There's so many ways to tap into self. It's like, it's not really that big of a mystery (laughs) as it turns out (laughs) this whole uh, infinite selfhood that we're all expressions of. But while we're here in the last couple of minutes of the free show, why don't you give everybody, I guess, links to where they can find you online, where you might like to connect with them on social media and maybe tell us about anything that you're currently working on project wise. Everybody can reach me at my main site, shift.is. It's a website focused on personal evolution and collective evolution. And you could also find me on minds.com, which is a alternative social network that I would love to see more conscious community get on. You can find me at minds.com slash shift is now. And I'm also on Twitter, Twitter at Paul Linda and on MeWe as well. I'm on there. You can find me, Paul Luminari. And on YouTube, uh, my channel is called The Luminous Shift. And I am I have two courses available. Uh, one is for energy protection. Another is for heart lucidity, creating a the per- heart perception so you can experience reality through your heart field. And... Also, I have a reality alchemy course coming soon that's going to be really helpful. It'll show you how to play with reality and do things that you may have not even believed were possible. Uh, But I'm also available for consulting, coaching, guidance, and all that information is available at Shift as well. And you can also find my book, The Creation of a Consciousness Shift on Amazon, or you can grab an ebook copy on the shift's website in the store section. Yeah, I do recommend people check out the book. I'm curious, is there music online anywhere? Yeah, on SoundCloud, you can search for Turquoise Memories or on YouTube as well, Turquoise Memories. Radical. All that stuff is going to be linked in the show notes for you guys. One last question for the free show. If you had to give someone just one pointer or technique from, from the book that we've been talking about, and something that we haven't already touched on, what might it be? I would say, listen to your heart. Your heart will let you know 
what's the most important thing for you to do? Uh, that's a good message. It's one that resonates loud and clear with many of the recent and past guests on the show. The heart-centered life is the fulfilling one. And of course, Earth itself is an anagram of the word heart. <laughs> and most of the stuff on Earth is green. And in the chakra systems, the heart is green. I think we're trying to be shown a message here that it's about balancing the two sides of ourselves, the physical and the non-physical. The fact that we walk around without a head should tell us something <laughs> and that you can see your whole body below you, but where's your head? You have to look in a mirror for that. And that's what we have each other for is to be these divine mirrors. So thanks for coming on, Paul. And we'll talk to you on the other side with the uh, plus members. Yeah, thanks for having me. My homeland of Missouri. Woo wee! That was a good one. <laughs> but really, loved that episode with Paul Linda. Knew that I would enjoy speaking with that cat. I've been aware of him for a long time online. You see these types of people that are going around trying to constantly inspire and motivate and inform and educate others. Paul is one of those people. Really, really awesome guy. Hope you guys go find his writing online. He's got a book. He's got a great website at shift.is. You can go on some musical voyages with him. In fact, the music that I put in between segments in this episode was Paul's Pleiadian. No, not his Pleiadian vacation link. He did bring that up. You should go listen to that. Go find Paul's SoundCloud. It is Turquoise Memories. Great beats to harvest on there. And I did happened to notice that he just shared an article about how listening to new music is good for your brain. And that's what I mean about this guy. He's constantly sharing interesting and empowering information. If you weren't with us for the plus extension in the second hour, some of that really interesting information that I'm talking about, you can find there. <laughs> we talked about Paul's December 21st, 2012 adventure at the Mayan ruins at Chichen Itza. That was a really cool story. Anything about 2012 kind of fascinates me because that was such a weird time in my life. In general, we talked about pyramids and ancient structural free energy technologies, reincarnation and mapping higher self source field consciousness. We talked about Paul's various personal meditation practices and some that you might benefit from. Advice was given for empaths and help to not feel so drained by the world. We talked about learning to create energy psychic balls out of our hands, like Goku and Dragon Ball Z, like Kamehameha, except not exactly the same as in the cartoon. However, you can actually create energy balls and shoot them around. It's totally real. We talked about training yourself to see more of the reality, like aura energy. And we talked about hyperdimensional parasites and artificial intelligence. And that's just a few of the topics. I just wanted to give you the highlights. I mean, without giving much away, there's plenty more to get into there. And as a Plus subscriber, you get an entire archive of extended two-hour episodes that are just as good as this one, most likely. Or the new feature on my website where you can just buy a single Plus episode without becoming a subscriber. I'd love to see some of you guys checking that out. Speaking of subscribers, this would be a good time to mention some shout outs that are due. Thank you, Molly Holland, for your recent subscription on Patreon. Thank you so much. And a big shout out to Kurt Dickinson, my fractal family, really awesome brother, for keeping up a $25, wow, recurring monthly subscription. Thanks, man. Above and beyond. You're doing five people's job for him because that could have been five regular plus members at $5 a month. Thank you. I do need all the support I can get to keep this thing improving, growing, evolving, and getting better. All of the above. 
I'm going to keep doing it regardless of if I get any money. But if I get more money, I can get more equipment. That's kind of the first and best thing. And then maybe even, who knows, like start supporting myself a little bit off of this podcasting gig too. That would be quite an awesome thing. I can definitely imagine it being the case. So help me bring my imaginary dreams into reality, real reality by becoming a plus member. I'll stop begging for now, but (laughs) I don't know if that constitutes begging. I do have one more shout out to give. The new intro music that you heard this episode and the previous one, it's going to be the intro music going forward, is by Wisdom Traders, good friend of mine, David Duncan, who makes awesome beats on SoundCloud. You can find it at Wisdom Traders. Go check him out. Links to Paul's website, his book, plus extension, everything, all going to be in the podcast show notes. And that's it for me. I mean, I don't even know what needs to be said about this episode. It kind of speaks for itself. We talked about the alpha and omega consciousness, the feeling of I am, the real truth about who we are as infinite, unified life energy. So what more do y'all need to know? I feel like super inspired to go draw. (laughs) I have an awesome idea for a new piece of art. I just finished a big piece of art. Kind of cool. I should probably work on other stuff that makes me a little more money, but hey, you got to do what you enjoy and see where you go. So thanks for listening. Love you guys. Got an excellent set of guests coming out in the next couple of weeks. Really excited about how my schedule's looking. All thanks to the really great time I had at the Full Moon Metaphysical Fair. So thank you, Desiree and Charles Folds, for putting on the Metaphysical Fair that I was just at. If I met you at that event and you're checking out the show, thanks for tuning in. And I hope you find more of what you like. You guys know you can always hit me up through my website, through social media. I'm all over the internet. I'm on there too much, actually. Make it a little bit nicer for me by saying hi, dropping a line, giving some feedback about the show. Whatever you want to do. Tell me you hate me. I don't even care. I'll laugh. (laughs) Okay. But for real, guys, I've got to get out of here so I can start working on the next one. Thanks for listening. See you guys next time. Take care of yourself. Love yourself. All of the above. Bye-bye.